We're living in massive uncertainty right now. There's no doubt that we're going to have a recession. The recession began prior to the pandemic. It's becoming more difficult today to start a practice from scratch. Because you've got a lot of fixed costs, huge rents that we're looking at, overheads. So it's still a business, and if, you, if you're not seeing a certain amount of patients, you can't stay in business for long. Earning before interest taxes, appreciation, and coronavirus. That's as a solo practice owner, you don't have the support of, of a large group, and you're speaking to that. The ability to communicate with our patients, what we do and how we do it, that's going to be one of the key drivers for us to come back. The practices that have the strongest culture are going to come back the strongest. We all care about our patients. We all want to help our patients. There's so much fear. How do you become a leader in this time of crisis to keep the morale up and keep your team engaged? Yeah. See, now just, just, I want my uh, kiss video. <laughs> <laughs>
we had, if you want to call it a virtual command center that we started, and we were dealing with everything from what is the definition of an emergency patient, which was not necessarily clear. Uh, we operated in multiple provinces, and I know that uh, there was no national uh, coherent message coming from the Canadian Dental Association or the American Dental Association right off the gate with regards to what is considered an emergency. And part of the challenge that regulators have had is they have actually been monitoring this. It's been ever evolving and it's been difficult for them to define what is uh, safe for patients and what is safe for uh, employees. And so from our perspective, you know, we've been taking it day by day, but trying to plan ahead. Obviously there's been a shortage of uh, personal protective equipment and given the volume of clinics that we manage, we have had a need to see emergency patients. We've been following the provincial uh, guidelines with respect to triaging patients and ensuring that our employees are, are safe. And we've never said to any employee uh, that doesn't want to come to work because they don't feel safe, that they must have to. And I think a lot of this comes down to putting your employees first and your patients first before the interests of your shareholders. Because if you don't have those two um, healthy, how are you going to run a practice? I think I gave a little bit of background uh, about MCA. Um, myself, personally, I have been working in the healthcare industry uh, my entire career, which was started back in 2005, and the last 10 years has been spent exclusively working with dentists across mm -hmm. both Canada and the U.S. Um, MCA only focuses on Canada, but prior to that, I was advising doctors that were seeking to transition, start practices from scratch, as well as ones that were struggling with a lot of the HR day-to-day -day management issues that you come across. And I think the reason why we decided to put on this webinar is to give you the perspective, not only from a DSO, but also Dr. Bisp being completely independent, she's not affiliated with MCA, what's it really like being a solo practice owner today? And what are the things you're going to go through? Yeah, so I think that's probably why this we complement each other, right? Because I... Um, have a solo practice in Oakville and I work uh, with five hygienists and have built like a really strong periodontal and restorative focus, um, which also has some unique components. And I've also been um, involved with an online teaching program for dentists, which I really originally started in um, 2008 and it's called UPB Dental Academy, which offers like various programs all online, focusing on all like the different challenges that all dentists, owners and associates, like we all face uh, when it comes to running or working in a dental office daily. Um, the other thing is, is that um, the my office and some of our early adopters have been testing ground for these programs. And so we've worked really hard at making them customizable, easy and fall to follow, like things like that, like really add value and efficiency and profitability to any dental practice. Um, so if anybody wants um, more information on this, you guys can contact me directly or you can go on our website, UPB Dental Academy. But today I am here to offer the solo practitioner or solo owner point of view to really complement CNA, because we're coming from such different perspectives in some way, but also um, offer some suggestions and solutions that are, you know, based on what I've learned and especially from a lot of my own challenges in the past, and maybe just connect with all of you regarding what's happening now and really how to move forward. So, Mark, maybe you want to just um, tie it all up and let us know who you are. Certainly, thanks, uh, Agatha. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, being in the dental space now as a coach for over 20 years, and I've also had the pleasure of working with Dr. Bist, UPB Dental Academy, and some interaction with MCA. So I've seen both sides of that coin so far. Uh, as a coach and as, and as a thought leader in dentistry, what I like to do is create cohesive teams, obviously work on production, and sort of move those practices from, from where they are now to the, the destination of where they need to be in the future. And right now, that future is very uncertain. What we used to call business as usual, I'm now tokening as business unusual in the new normal as we go forward. And we're really here to offer our support and different perspectives. Myself as a coach who has been a COO at the DSO level and also manage and run uh, solo practice. So I've got experience on both sides of that coin. And I see how they, they parallel each other very nicely. And there are some disparate you know, thoughts and changes on how they proceed. Uh, I'm just getting a lot of questions coming across on the chat board too, so please feel free. If you have questions, we will answer them at the end of the seminar. 
And uh, I'm also seeing that people are asking for contact and handout information. Uh, so that also will be available to you at the end. And again, we appreciate that you, as our audience today, are taking time out of your day. I know there's a lot of chaos going on, a lot of planning, and this is really part of it. This is the, we've said we, we never have enough time, and now we have time. And even if your webinar, don't, hopefully you'll in, indulge us today, and this will be time well spent. Uh, the, the next thing we want to look at with the economy the way it is, the economy of dentistry, when we go back, uh, Sina, you, you use this phrase with me, are we going to come back to a U-shaped economy or is it going to be a V? And maybe you can illustrate what that means uh, from your perspective and how that's going to affect the DSO space. Sure. So if you've been following the news, a lot of you will uh, hear that there's no doubt that we're going to have a recession. We're already in one. I'm of the mindset that the recession began prior to the pandemic. And the reason I say that is because if you look at what the Federal Reserve in the U.S. was doing prior to the shutdown of businesses was they were pumping um, liquidity into the uh, U.S. Uh, overnight market, um, which is called the repo market. And the banking sector, I believe, started having issues prior to the pandemic. And the pandemic has been the accelerator of the downturn. I don't believe it's the cause of it. And so the state of the dental industry prior to the pandemic, um, as many of you associate dentists know, it's becoming more difficult today to start a practice from scratch because of the fact that there are less patients per dentist mm -hmm. than there were 20 years ago, right? Yeah. Um, at the same time, if you look at asset prices, and let's forget about dentistry for a second, look at asset prices across the board, since 2008, where we injected a ton of liquidity into the system, what we've seen is an asset bubble. We've seen practice values, business values in general, doesn't matter what type of business you own, go up. And as a result of that, what is occurring is a lot of the uh, doctors who would have come out of dental school 20 years ago that would have gone into ownership immediately have actually decided, given the increase in tuition in dental schools today, in addition to the lack of access to practices for sale, to basically associate for a couple of years. And since then, the markets have frozen. And so what you're seeing is not only are practices not trading hands in the solo market, uh, going from owners to uh, associates, right? There's been a lot of uncertainty, and I would say price discovery, meaning um, if somebody came to you today as a broker and said, I have a practice for sale, and it's prior uh, year's EBITDA was $200,000, is it $200,000 today, right? It's not generating any cash flow. And so I add a C to the term EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, appreciation, and what I call coronavirus. That's the new measure of profitability, right, in, in, in the dental industry. And, and so for a lot of uh, buyers, um, they're expressing uh, uncertainty or uh, concern as a DSO, the benefit that we have is that we have a long-term horizon, and so for us, it's not about what you did last year as far as, you know, production or EBITDA. Um, we tend to take a long-term view of the market, and as a result of that, I would say we have a bit more flexibility um, than some buyers would with regards to looking at uh, supporting clinics that need the support, whether it's financially or with, with the practice management resources. So a lot of practice owners today, I would say, are in limbo. They're not sure when they're going to open their clinic and how it may affect their cash flow. And going back to your uh, question with regards to what type of recovery we're going to have, I believe that the recovery is going to depend on what happens with the economy. And so what I mean by that is you're seeing a huge decline in consumer confidence, both in the U.S., Canada, and around the world. And we're in the business of retail dentistry. And so what that means is that if the consumer, if the uninsured population, let's say in the U.S., goes from 40% to 70%, well, you're going to see a decline in patient visits. In Canada, we have, I would say, better access to care for the most part, but nevertheless, right, in Alberta, you have the anticipated unemployment rate going to 25%. And you kind of wonder if you're a dental practice owner in that province, uh, given the collapse in oil prices, while we were affected by the pandemic as well, whether or not, you know, an employee working in the energy sector is going to come back for their hygiene appointment. And so it is very much dependent on the economy. And I'm of the belief that we haven't hit the bottom yet, and you're going to see further declines 
uh, and rises, just declines in the financial markets and then rises in unemployment. And if the numbers tell us anything, you know, the number of individuals that are applying for unemployment insurance has not been increasing. And I think that there are a lot of companies that will be forced to lay off more employees if they haven't already. And your patients are the economy, right? If they're not feeling good, uh, they may not come back. And the other side of this as well is keep in mind that a lot of patients' uh, sense of health has been heightened. And they're hearing in the news that aerosols are the way that you can catch coronavirus. They're also hearing that uh, it can even be airborne. And so what I wonder is if the consumer coming back from this uh, closure uh, is going to want to sit in the dental chair. And it's up to us as providers to really educate them on why we went through the AIDS crisis of the 1990s, right? If you own a clinic in the 90s, you know how to sterilize your practice. You know how to make sure that it's a safe environment. And part of what I believe is that um, we've been trained for many years to be able to provide patients with a safe environment. I feel more comfortable walking into a dental office than I do a grocery store today. Yeah. And I think you have to remind patients of that. And, you know, Agatha, you're going to have a completely different take on this because as a solo practice owner, you don't have the support of, of a large group. And you're speaking to that that dentist right now who's probably got huge rents that they're looking at, overheads and all these type of things. How is this economy going to look for you when they finally give us what might be a, a soft green light to go back to work? Yeah, very soft, I think. Um Number one, I think we're going to find ourselves um, very regulated, at least at the beginning, in terms of you know how many patients we can see and um, you know how much space is in between these people coming through and how to manage it. So I think there's going to be a lot of changes, at least initially, in terms of um, the flow, and that may impact some businesses. I know for a lot of dentists that I speak to one on one, you know it's still a business, and if you if you're not seeing a certain amount of patients. Uh, you can't stay in business for long. So the new reality is going to be how to how to you know balance between you know how we're going to be regulated versus um, what we need to do in order to stay alive, right, and stay afloat. <clears throat> so the economic factor is obviously in my mind. Um, the other thing I'm finding is a lot of dentists I talk to are really panicking because there's really not a lot of information yet in terms of how we're going to come back. So not only do we not know when, but we also don't really know how, which is part of that, you know, the unknown is really, really scary. The one thing that you said, Sina, that really um, I totally agree with and like really hits home is the ability to communicate with our patients in terms of um, what we do and how we do it. I don't think people really realize just how safe dental offices are and have always been more so than movie theaters or restaurants or grocery stores or anything else. So you know, one of the things that if we do start opening up businesses, including ours, um, making sure that people understand that, you know, everything that we're doing and how safe it is to come in here versus a movie theater, for example. Um, the other thing, too, is that I find it interesting because it kind of depends on the type of practice you have. Like we have I have. I've always spent a lot of time focusing on my hygiene department and it's something, you know, you and I have talked about many times. But I have patients actually calling and emailing going, I have an emergency. I need my teeth clean. Like they consider that an emergency. So I think if we really focus on when we're talking about health, we talk about the health overall, like how your mouth affects the rest of you and your immune system really pump up the information that you put out, whether it's your website or how you communicate to your patients, but really making sure that they understand that in order to stay healthy, your mouth has to be healthy. And I think that's going to be one of the key drivers for us to come back to a solid structure is really the hygiene department and just the basic restorative type of stuff that we need to focus on right now. Thanks, Agatha. You know, as we as we sort of travel this journey together in our industry, we've got to think about operationally. Things were one way before this COVID-19 pandemic and are going to be very different right now, even, even moving forward. And, uh, Sina, you've got multiple clinics. Is there a process that's being put into place right now or are there plans that are being, you know, engaged to deal with the COVID-19 as far as operational change? So there's no doubt that if you own a clinic today, you must be operating your standard operating procedures. You must be updating those 
to reflect what's happening, right? And so I believe most uh, clinicians that I've been dealing with this have. And coming out of it, I agree with Agatha that we're not going to see less requirements as it pertains to infection control protocols. We're going to see more requirements. And because we're going to see more requirements, I believe that you have to prepare yourself now to be able to handle the additional, uh, if you want to call it regulation, yeah. um, that's going to come out of this, right? And, and if you look at other countries, whether it's China, which is way ahead of us in terms of dealing with the pandemic, when they reopened dental clinics um, in China, right, there were measures put in place. So it wasn't business as before, right? It was, let's reopen these clinics, but we must now ensure that we have additional PPEs, personal protective equipment, and we don't yet know whether or not the provincial regulators are going to recommend um, once you're reopened, you can't have more than a certain number of, let's say, patients in your waiting room. Or if you're going to triage patients, right, are you still going to need to screen for those that have COVID-19? Because pandemics, they can be flattened as a curve, but they don't immediately go to zero. And in fact, China's currently monitoring uh, on a regular basis the number of cases, despite businesses being reopened. And there's nothing that guarantees that come fall, we're not going to have an uptick in the number of cases again, right? Because pandemics are very dynamic in nature. And so the hope here is that when we are uh, able to reopen, we spend the time thinking about how we're gonna change our processes to be able to react to the realities of practice management. And in addition to that, I think even if there is not additional uh, regulation, what you need to do as a practice owner is you need to communicate to your patients, like Agatha was saying, why it is safe to come back for treatment. So although you're open, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that every patient is gonna to wanna to come back. Exactly. So I, and I, when you look at that, the operational changes just leading up to this, and, and as, as I recall, you were away when you heard about this whole thing shifting from a very scary time to an absolute, we're done. I'm just, I'd love to get your perspective on what that was like and how you communicated those challenges with your staff and the steps you took, uh, you know, operationally. Well, I mean, it was, it was a big shock to me, right? Because I, like you said, I had been away and as much as you check in with life and uh, your office, I, I was sort of in a surreal place that really we weren't feeling what you guys were feeling here. So when I got the email that, you know, we were um, recommended to shut down. I was kind of chatting with a couple of my classmates about it and and then called the office. Um, yeah, I was like, you know, I'm sure a lot of dentists were in the same boat. It's like, well, what does that mean? And what do you do now? Like, OK, so we shut down, but then for how long? Right. So the big issue is, is it two weeks? Is it two months? Is it six months? And then, you know, how do you stay in touch with your people? How do you stay in touch with your patients? How do you make sure that, you know, you've got a business to come back to when you open up again? Because the reality is if we don't connect with people, um, they're going to forget about you. So the first thing that, I, you know, we did um, as an office was to make sure that we reach out to all the patients that were scheduled like right away. And we're continuously doing that now. And a lot of the times, um, you know, most offices probably do this too, but we make sure that we indicate in the computer how people like to communicate. So if somebody like wants to hear from us by text, then we text. And if somebody likes the phone, then we call. So we've been really engaged in making sure that we really connect with people, especially the ones who want to be called because they all want to talk, right? So, you know, when we call, it's not like a two minute conversation. It's a half an hour conversation about how everyone's right. handling it, right? And that I think is really, really important and has been um, truly eye opening to really see how your patients see you and really position yourself as a human being, right? So it builds respect. And I mean, we've got nothing else to do in this time. We might as well, you know, pick up the phone and say, how are you doing? You know, do you need anything? And also just kind of go, you know, what's going to happen, reassure them that at some point when we open up, there are going to be changes that we're going to have to make. So we'll communicate that to you when, you know, when we know a little bit more, but we're constantly in touch with our patients. And I think that's something that, you know, I find very, very important and make sure that your business is, is there when, whenever it is ready to come back to. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm working with a company, EDMS Dental, and we're actually working on a process right now on how to reach out to patients. So we'll yeah. talk about that a little bit later because I've got a really good strategy that's going to create community between the dental offices at the DSO level space. And again, uh, I that for people like yourselves who've got a solo practice, we'll talk to that later. One of the things that everyone is going to be struggling with right now and on a large scale with the DSO, and a large scale when you're when your own operator, is you've got a lot of fixed costs that don't go away because of this. Yeah. There's rents, there's leases, and I know we're juggling with banks right now. We're not going to get too deep into the weeds on that. Yeah. I'm just curious, Tina, especially for you in, a, in large groups, how are you dealing with those fixed costs? And then I'll defer to you, Agatha, and on your space, I know some of your overheads, there has not been a lot of negotiation to how you're mastering that managing that and i know there's a lot of people right now scratching their head looking for that information so see i'll go to you first on how are you managing fixed costs at a large dso scale sure so i think for any practice owner whether you own one or a hundred clinics the uh, biggest fixed expense that you have aside from employee salaries is going to be your commercial rent and i've received calls from dentists that have been um, wondering whether or not their landlord is going to want to give them a rent abatement. And so if you haven't had that conversation, what you want to be asking the landlord, the landlord for ideally is a 90-day rent abatement and get them to actually tack on that rent, that three months worth of rent, on the back end of your lease. Okay. Now, there are going to be situations where you're leasing space from a mom and pop landlord or you're leasing space from a commercial real estate investment trust. How those landlords approach the negotiation is completely different because if the landlord owns one building and it's their lifeline and that's what they're relying on to pay all their expenses, well, guess what? They're not going to be necessarily open to giving you um, a rent abatement, right? If you're dealing with a REIT, it depends on whether or not they have a huge exposure to the retail sector. A lot of them that have properties in your city want to maintain their reputation. We've been very fortunate in that one of our landlords happens to own a ton of commercial real estate in the Ottawa area. And I find because they are in the position to be able to negotiate, because they can from a capital liquidity standpoint, they're open to giving rent abatements, right? Whereas other landlords are less reluctant to do so. So rent is one thing you want to address. If any of you are leasing your equipment, you want to have a conversation with your suppliers with regards to deferring those payments. And I would say that um, the suppliers we deal with have been extremely kind and generous and understanding. And uh, I can't say thank you enough to them for being so cooperative and yeah. for supporting the dental industry. And I know some of them are on this call today as well. Um, so rent, your equipment leases, and you have your sundry expenses, which is easy to defer because you're not going through much sundry orders anyways. Um, and so you want to give uh, yourself the option there to uh, not have a cash outlay for not generating revenue. And then with regards to banking, it is highly dependent on whether you're a solo practice or you're a DSO. Uh, because in our case, we have both access to the private capital markets as well as debt financing, whereas a lot of solo practice owners only have access to debt financing. And so what's happening with most banks is they're agreeing to uh, allow the practice owner, whether it's a single or multiple practice owner, to be able to make only interest payments on that loan and not pay the principal. And it is heavily uh, dependent on the amount of debt that you have. And I also believe that it depends on which bank you're working with. because Prior to the pandemic, um, there were some banks that extended financing in the, the dental sector, and those banks that have high exposure to businesses that are shut down may see higher loan loss provisions than others, right? So the, uh, the, the bank itself um, is going to be given additional liquidity. How they provide that liquidity to small and medium-sized business owners is really on a case-by-case -case basis in my experience, but I believe that the federal government is going to try to coordinate you know, their monetary and fiscal policy such that small business owners can actually continue to be in business, um, yeah. considering how many people employ. 
you, you know, Agatha, we were talking offline the other day, and you told me that you were actually putting together a structured plan on where does the money go now? Because it's going to be very different on how you address that, you know, in a month from now and two months from now, as opposed to how you did that at the beginning of March. I know you, you don't want to go into a whole course on that, but maybe you can touch on a few points because there were some very powerful bits that you shared with me that yeah. would, would resonate with a lot of doctors. Hey, you're talking about the, the program that I put together that we're giving away with this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it's, it was, I think there's some really powerful, insightful information. So, yeah, I'll come back to that in one one minute. I just want to kind of comment on um, a lot of what Sina was saying, and I, I think I do agree that in many ways, um, you know, being a, a large corporation, you have a little bit more power and a little bit more leeway in order to negotiate certain things. I think as a solo practitioner. I found it a real challenge, like uh, and talking with other dentists who have, you know, their own practices like I do. Very few landlords are actually deferring or even cooperating with us at all. And I've been, you know, after mine every single day. And it's it's not as easy as it sounds, you know, like you hear that they're supposed to be reasonable. But it's a lot of us are in the same boat where we still have to pay the rent. Uh, I agree with you 100 percent when it comes to leases. I've had like 100 percent cooperation with um, any of my equipment leases that I have. So they've been deferred and I'm very grateful for that. And I think just again, speaking to a lot of dentists, um, anybody who's got lease payments to make, those have been deferred. Um, but even bank loans, like if you have um, bank loans, a lot of banks are not cooperating at all. Like they're not just allowing the interest payments. They're pulling out the principal every single, like at least so far what I've seen. So again, as a solo practitioner, we do have to really plan um you know for those things like rent and even utilities right i mean you can't let that go for a long time because whether well, you're just gonna shut your phone down right so in reality we do have to plan and whether it's a two-month closure or you know as some people are fearing that it's a six-month closure you got to know what your numbers are um so, and then you also have to figure out how you're going to when you open up at a slower pace potentially how you're going to be able to you know pay that over time because we are all going to go into a lot of debt trying to maintain our businesses um i think the one thing that um mark you're talking about is with this webinar uh, we're going to send you all a link to a program that i've actually quickly put together um as a gift to everybody in order to figure out how sort of how i've always done my or for a long time, have I've always dealt with my operating expenses and um, ensuring that there's always profitability in the business. So uh, at the end of it, we'll include that link, but it basically, it'll probably be very useful for you moving forward because it allows you to really structure your spending based on what's coming in, not what was, you know, last year. Cause I mean, that's what everybody does. We look at, you know, our PL statements, which is kind of like driving backwards, right? You're looking backwards, but last year is not at all a reflection of what's going to happen this year. So we need to know what is coming ahead and how to plan for that. And also how to really educate your team, right? Your people, because let's face it, a lot of employees don't really understand, um, you know, the, the business side of running a practice and really having them understand you know, where the numbers are coming from and where they're going and how to manage those, you know, monthly expenses is really key and getting ahead long term and building a stronger business. Well, I appreciate that. I'll thank you in advance for that because there's a lot of powerful information that's going to put a lot of minds at ease and give some direction going forward. You know, when we talk about our, our dental offices, if you walk into any office right now, there's probably somewhere in the office, there's a mission statement on the wall, there's in the back of a in the back of a binder somewhere. These are the core values of the office. And now more than ever, these things have to have true meaning. And I'm just curious, again, Sina, you, you work in volumes of offices, a number of different practices. I'm sure there's an MCA sort of protocol mission statement, vision statement. How, how is that working right now? And how are people measuring up to that vision and mission for MCA? And how does that speak to the DSO space? And again, I know you've got a very similar sort of set of rules, if you will, that you want your team to follow and the level of commitment to the patients that each patient deserves. How's that going to affect? Is that really having an effect now with your teams and sort of your mindsets? So I think from our perspective, um, 
it's not important just to have a mission and vision statement. The question I would ask everybody on this webinar, whether you work on the provider side of the industry or you're a manufacturer or supplier, is if I called 10 of your employees at 4 a.m. in the morning and I asked them, what's your company's mission statement? Are they going to give me the same answer? Or am I going to get 10 different answers? And so the question here is, do they believe it, right? And if you look at millennial employees, they've gone through a 2008 financial crisis. They have this uh, distrust for not only government, but also for big corporations, right? And so the question is, how are you implementing your mission statement? And are you saying and doing what your mission statement says? you should be doing. And so that's one thing. The other thing is, for many of you, you may find this question a bit funny because your employees are temporarily laid off. So you're asking yourself the question, well, why would they believe in the mission statement if they're not working? And my, my, my recommendation to you is realizing that there's ways that you can engage them in the community um, beyond just employment. And so if you're doing a PPE drive and they happen to have a child in school that's also got personal protective equipment, you know, are they willing to engage that school in donating that equipment to frontline healthcare workers? Um, how are you communicating with your employees while they're on layoff? So in our case, we have a weekly um, note that goes out from our CEO to our employees, and it gives them an update on what are the challenges that we're facing as a DSO, and what are we tracking in terms of you know, government subsidy programs that are available for access? Where, where are we unclear with regards to not having answers? Uh, and so we can all get better at communicating with our employees. And uh, when all this is said and done, I believe that the practices that have the strongest uh, culture are going to come back the strongest, right? Uh, and, and part of this has to do with resilience but also how you treat your patients and employees during a downturn is going to decide uh, whether or not you're successful. Yeah. They say true measure of a person as a leader is to judge them during crisis, not when things are great. And, and I think people are rising up right now more than they ever have. And I think that level of leadership, which is really what today is about creating leadership amongst our fraternity and our dental community for people, they now have to take the time to stand up. So Agatha, over to you, just, you know, you've got a culture in your office. You've really put together a strong team over the years you've been in business, I've stayed with you. How is this affecting them right now? And how are you sort of managing those emotions to keep them living up to your values and your, for lack of a better word, mission statement? So, I mean, I, you know, I've only got eight people in my office, so it's an easy one because I've just connected with them on FaceTime. We just set up individual times and then group times where we can chat and sort of figure out where everyone is and, you know, what they need and just feel supported. I mean, not much we can do about what's going on, but we can certainly communicate. And I think it's really important, um, so, you know, you mentioned that in terms of communicating, you know, what we're going through, like what the other side is, because a lot of people don't realize that um, there is a lot that we need to manage um, that our staff may not really understand until we communicate that. So really communicating that we're struggling um, just as much as they are, if not more in some cases, I think it's just really like without crying about it, but really just making sure that they understand that you're not out there gallivanting and going on vacations, but you are really trying to figure out how to keep this business afloat for however long it takes. Um, the other thing is like, wh whoever you're known for, that's what we've all created over time, right? So you've always, you're kind of always living your values and whatever you have been known for in the past, when before this happened is probably you know, what your core values are, whatever that means to you. Um, but this is kind of a unique opportunity to recreate yourself, right? So we've got time on our hands and really the opportunity is to figure out, you know, if I could do this again, or if I could do this better, or if I'm going to pretend that I'm starting a business from scratch, because for some of us, it might feel like that, right? At the beginning, at least. Um, what would you do different and why? So really figuring out, you know, why did we go into dentistry to begin with? Because, you know, when I look back, I didn't go into it to do what I'm, you know, to do what people think uh, I went into it for. I went into it to truly change the way people see us as dentists and 
you know, that's still my motivation. That always has been my motivation. And that's probably what you're referring to, Mark, because you sort of know how I do my practice. And for me, it's really, really important to live out your values and, and but really understand what they are. So, I mean, if it is that you want to be known for, you know, the, the best discounts, then go full out and be that, but figure it, figure out what you want to be known for and create a plan because we've got time and what that means for you, like moving forward. So like really come up with a strategic plan to become this, you know, say a year from now. Right. And, and just to, just to further this uh, notion that we're on right now about staying connected. And I think it's huge in our industry right now is there's a, I, I don't believe there's been this many webinars on dentistry or business <laughs> produced in the short period of time. Oh, sure. Yeah. And we're probably all getting drunk on webinars. And again, we appreciate the, the large number of people I see that are on this webinar. Yeah. Uh, on every one of them that I've sat in on, they say, stay connected with your team and stay connected with your patients as paramount. Now, I'm going to touch on two things here because I know basically how people are interacting with team. But with patients, they're usually getting, you know, a pre-recorded call, uh, an email, or a text. And, and something that, that we took it a little bit further at EDMS Dental, what we're actually doing is creating these type of forums yeah. on the dental practice and inviting patients into, into our offices, into our lives, yeah. to see how it humanizes the dentist for one thing, to say, hey, I'm suffering like you, I'm home with the kids, you know, my wife and my husband and I are making dinners, we, we've actually never sat down for dinner yeah. this many times. It kind of humanizes them. It, it allows the, the patients to have that interaction. And then it also gives them a chance to say, hey, listen, Mr. or Mrs. Patient, if you do think you have a dental emergency, here's my personal contact number. We can FaceTime. I can triage you whether you need to go to the hospital or what processes need to go into place. And I'm telling you right now that that kind of connection with your patients will last months, if not years, because it's like the virtual house call. These people actually care about me and I'm in their homes. And the, the practices that I've done it with, they've had at times, we had 120 patients on from one office down in the US. So it's something you may want to consider. It takes a little bit of time and planning, but it's a huge successful outreach to the patient. And, and you know, Sina, you've got multiple teams in multiple locations. And I'm just curious on how the DSO is handling keeping people connected and how the DSO is reaching out to their patients so that they know that there's a sense of community still. Yeah, so for us uh, and for many DSOs, um, as you decide uh, how to react to the uh, shutdown of the clinics, right, some, some DSOs choose to keep on the receptionists. Others uh, do it for a very limited time. Maybe they only have them make calls for three hours a day um, because they don't need the additional uh, time commitment. And so um, in our case, my experience has been when I've had a regional manager uh, reach out uh, to our patients, the overwhelming number of patients that we contact are extremely grateful for their communication. And as Agatha was saying, they don't want to chat for five minutes. They want to chat for 30 minutes or 50 minutes. And my recommendation to every dentist is that take the time to speak with those patients because that's going to pay dividends when you reopen. Number one. Number two, if any of you have received an email from the RCDSO or another uh, provincial regulator in Canada, you'll notice that some of your colleagues have left this to their voicemail, have left this to basically be you as a patient of record. I'm not open, so you should go to the hospital or if you need to go see another dentist, right, figure it out. I think that's the worst thing that you can do as a provider. And not only is it terrible for our industry, but also keep in mind that if that patient goes to the ER, the hospital is going to spend money on personal protective equipment. The nurses and physicians are not trained to deal with a dental emergency the way you are. So what's going to happen is they're going to give medication. The patient's going to then come back to another dentist. So you're going to double the number of PPEs that are used, right, which is going to further exacerbate the shortage of PPEs. And from a patient perspective, whether they, they walk into, you know, Dr. Smith's office or Dr. Jim's office, the reality is that their experience with dentistry hasn't been positive, right? And so the ER 
of hospitals is already overwhelmed with the number of COVID-19 patients. What we don't want to do as an industry is expose the patients that are healthy to that environment. And so how are you going to connect with those existing patients? And if you have, like most offices do, single office, three, four operatories, you may have 1,500 active patients, um, you know, make an effort to reach out to those patients, right, over the next few weeks and understand how they're dealing. And like you said, Mark, I think social media is a blessing. It's very easy for you to record a quick video on your iPhone and, you know, send it to your patients and just let them know how you're dealing with this crisis as a dentist. And that human touch goes a long way to them understanding that just because you're a dentist, you're not immune to what's going on in the economy. Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that I find because I am a small office and, um, you know, being a solo practitioner, it's a lot easier, obviously, for me to reach out to a lot of my patients and be able to respond one on one. I mean, I've had um, a number of people email me or call me. Um, most of my patients have my personal cell number. So I've had a couple calls and and, you know, most of them have been like. I have a question about this or you know i think i have some sensitivity would this be an emergency so a lot of it is more reassurance like it's as long as you talk to them about it a lot of it is never going to end up in the hospital um but i've had a couple of that were like really funny they were like panicking like i said earlier because they have to have their cleaning done and being able to explain to them that unfortunately that is not considered an actual emergency and we cannot do anything about that right now um but i've had a few calls like that and then i've had you know we all have patients and temporaries, right? So, you know, what do you do? Can you insert the final case if it's sitting in your office or do you have to wait till, you know, we're able to open and keep these people in temporary? So that's been a bit of a challenge for a lot of dentists. And I think one of the things that I'm hearing, again, speaking with my classmates and speaking with some local dentists, the biggest thing is like not really knowing how to handle the in-between stuff. Like we all know what to do when someone's in pain, right? We all know when they're swollen. Uh, we also know that if they call me and say I'm due for my cleaning, I can defer that. But what happens when it's something in between? And the reality is, is that, you know, it keeps changing what we can and cannot do and how to do it. And a lot of dentists have just become frozen. I think, you know, the emails that you're referring to, Sina, that talk about, you know, we have to remember to see our patients because you know, we're responsible for them. I think for the most part, from a lot of the dentists I speak to, we all care about our patients. We all want to help our patients. None of us are actually abandoning, abandoning them. I just feel like there's so much fear around, well, if I do, and then I can't, let's say, let's say I do something, but then I can't adjust it because I can't use a high speed, you know, am I then liable for if I create like pulpitis, right? And then, you know, how is, how is my license going to be impacted or how is my reputation going to be impacted if I do something, you know, a, a little bit as opposed to properly. And so that's the biggest thing is what do you do when, let's say, somebody has, you know, lost a filling? Um, they're not in pain. There's a hole in there. And is that considered an emergency? So dealing with these kind of things is, I think, where people are really struggling. And with all the emails that are coming through saying, you know, an emergency is this and, don't use aerosol and don't use a high speed. That's where I think the fear is coming from, from a lot of us. And I, and I think what we basically encapsulate, we are living in massive uncertainty right now. And, and every dentist out there that's, that's listening, you're all at a certain level of uncertainty. There are certain people that are reacting one way. There are certain people that are reacting a different way. But that level of uncertainty and that unknown is very challenging to process right now. But as leaders, we've got to actually step up and above that uncertainty to see it for better than it is, because that's the only way true leadership shines. And that's the only way you can move your team and elevate them into the future. And, and my, question, my question is this, because I'm sure you're all getting calls from team and morale may have been one way at the beginning of March. And <laughs> was, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> very much augmented right now. And, and what are the things you're going to do now to boost and maintain morale in that team. And as we come back, I, I keep telling dentists, as much as you think, you know, we might get the green light and the floodgates are gonna open, I think there's gonna be a little bit of hesitation as we roll back into the dental space. And how do we continue to keep our teams 
leveled up? How do we continue to boost morale and keep them behind you? How do, how do you become a leader in this time of crisis to keep the morale up and keep your team engaged and behind you 100%? And Cena, you've got a much bigger challenge. I know they're coming from two different perspectives, two different levels, but you've got to lead and be the example for perhaps hundreds, if not thousands of people. Yeah, so it is challenging because we are an acquisitive organization. So that means that what we do is we end up inheriting a culture that has been there for 20 plus years. And so it's important to, I think, maintain the identity of the clinic that you buy, whether you're a single uh, practitioner looking to buy more offices or you're looking to support more clinics as a DSO. And without letting, or maybe I should let the cat out of the bag, what we're going to be doing, uh, and it's going to be announced to our employees very shortly, is we're going to run a contest. Uh, it's going to be a, a little bit of a, a fun contest for those employees that are at home to tell us how you're basically spending your time and, uh, and also tie it to a music uh, theme. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, I think a lot of the employees are going to appreciate that there's going to be a cash prize attached to this, and it's kind of a fun way to... Uh, just let other team members know what you're up to. And in addition to that, uh, we've been rolling out uh, calls uh, by location. So we're having these happy hour calls where we all get on Zoom and we can communicate with our uh, teams, our local teams. And I think uh, for the dentists that are looking at this uh, as a single provider, the reality is that you're not going to know where the demand is going to be in the next couple of months. So one of the things you want to consider is uh, this fact that you may not be in the position necessarily to rehire all of your hygienists or your DAs uh, at the same time. And for those that are not going to be recalled, right, um, I hope that you can recall all of them, but if you can recall all of them, what are you doing to help them? And so it could be, uh, hey, I have a colleague and all of you have gone to dental school, so there's 20 plus uh, friends you have uh, in dentistry. Maybe their practices are growing and maybe they're looking to hire temp staff or they're looking to hire more employees. And so uh, don't look at it just from the perspective of I'm not hiring today. If you have colleagues in the profession that are uh, in the position financially to be able to hire more employees, uh, can you put those uh, hygienists or dental assistants in touch with your colleagues? And one of the benefits I think we have in the dental industry is prior to the pandemic, the unemployment rate for hygienists was you know, about 1%. Um, and so it was low unemployment to begin with. And I don't believe that unemployment rates in dentistry will become double digit like the rest of the economy. Uh, and so for a lot of these um, team members, I certainly hope that it is going to be a short lived period. Um, and demand will come back eventually because uh, if you look at recession uh, resistance, uh, there is a reason why dentistry attracts so much capital, right? It's because we are a healthcare uh, organization, we're a healthcare service provider, and at the end of the day, um, you can neglect your oral health, right, but you're going to end up just deferring that investment to a later time, um, and it can balloon to an additional cost if it's an emergency. And so I'm pretty confident that there's always going to be a need for dental practices to operate, and if 2008 shows us anything, I think the dentists that were over leveraged suffered the most, but for those that, uh, you know, had thought about the long-term view, um, they came out of it uh, much stronger and able to pick up patients. Um, oh, <laughs> you know, I really like, um, I really love your idea. I actually wrote this down scene. I'm going to do that with my office. Uh, the, you know, the contest, like very cool. Cause if you post that on social, like patients are totally going to eat it up, right? Cause you're just totally showing, you know, like your own, human side to what's going Absolutely. on right now. So I'm going to steal that from you. So you might see some of our videos out there. Um, but I do love the idea too, of like staying connected with your team. Um, because as more information comes out, right, it's just being able to have like a zoom party. I mean, I feel like I'm having a zoom party every night, uh, with different <laughs> and it's like, wow, five o'clock hits, let's go. Right. But, um, I think that it's become, it's going to become even more important as, as we start to figure out, you know, when the date is that we're coming back to and also how we're coming back, because as you're talking to your team, especially in a group setting and a more relaxed setting where you're like, you know, maybe get a glass of wine and kind of catch up on what everyone's doing is going to give us all a sense of like 
team community in order to how to move forward and really come up with ideas. Like I, I, I'll do this a lot. I'll say, look, this is the situation and I need your input because I'm stuck and I really don't know how to fix this. And a lot of the times we may be in a situation where we're coming back to maybe not a part-time type of situation, but there'll definitely be less work. And how do we do that? I mean, do we not bring one or two people back or do we maybe come up with other ideas so we can have everybody back, but in different scenarios or different terms. So instead of just me making all the decisions, I'm actually going to throw that out at my team and say, you know, let's all chat. So it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, it, Sina, just, just, I want my uh, kiss video. Uh, <laughs> 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 Do I submit that? I want that to be the benchmark for your people. If you haven't seen it, check out my LinkedIn feed. Oh my I God. Had a lot of fun with a uh, mop and a Kiss Alive 2 song from 1977. Oh my God. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into, into the HR side of, of what this is going to look like as we move into uh, coming back to work. But I'm sure that you guys are all thinking about the plans that you're going to need to put in place. How does this look like, you know, Sina, from you with a, with a large group? From a human resources perspective, what protocols need to be in place as we take our next steps into the future? So what's concerning to me is that in the dental industry, uh, an alarming number of clinics don't have employment contracts to this day, despite all the lawyers telling you you should have one, right? So I think the first thing you want to do as a practice owner is look at the employee agreements that you have and understand what your obligations are as an employer to that employee. Because if you temporarily laid off that employee, and this pandemic becomes more prolonged than is expected. In most countries, it's been about 90 days. Um, you have to basically determine if in the event that this contract is frustrated, right, uh, or you need to extend it layoff, and for whatever reason, the employee doesn't want to agree to it. I know some provinces differ in terms of regulations as far as what's legal and what's not. But at the end of the day, just understand what your severance liability is, understand that you have to be compliant with the um, state or the provincial regulations as far as labor relations is concerned. And um, being transparent goes a long way. And I think you have to communicate with your team that we're doing our best to fill the schedule. And once you're able to fill the schedule, I think you'll have much more confidence in terms of deciding who to recall. But if you have poor hygienists and for whatever reason, uh, demand is not back to where it was prior to the pandemic, and you have to pick two of them, understand that you just can't pick your two favorite, right? You have to you have to really be crystal clear and speak with an employment lawyer with regards to what your liabilities are. And I think a lot of uh, dentists uh, fortunately have been in contact with employment lawyers, but for those that have not had employment agreements in place, uh, it is going to be a bit of a challenge for you because under in Ontario, under ESA, if there is a termination of agreement, right, they're going to get paid the maximum under uh, ESA standards, whereas uh, in the contract it can be defined as something less. And so understand your obligations. And number two, uh, try to make sure that you're able to book all these patients into the schedule. So meaning don't recall everybody uh, when the pandemic is over and your business is open and hope that if you build it, they will come because there's no guarantee that 100% of your patients are going to want to book those appointments. Um, Mark and I know of a really good um, employment lawyer um, who works strictly with dentists. So if anybody is interested in um, a referral, like we can provide that his name in um, in in the follow up email. His name is Jonathan Borelli. Um, it, from talking to him in the last couple of weeks the employment law is changing like daily. So there's a lot of different things that are being implemented and changed. So just something to be aware of that, you know, if you are, like Sina said, looking at potentially starting a little bit slower and maybe bringing in less people at the beginning, um, just make sure you kind of know how to do it properly because it is constantly changing. So what we thought was the right way to do it like two weeks ago uh, might be a little bit different next time. Uh, I got kicked out. So there's a you, quick poll that just popped up here. Yeah, I got kicked out. No, you're in. No, so you're still in. I think uh, once everybody finishes this poll, we'll be back online here. Oh, I see, I see. So maybe should we, um, 
consider. So everybody can hear hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Are we waiting? So I think the, yeah. I, I think we're waiting for everybody to finish the poll. But in okay. the meantime, uh, what I was going to say is I, I totally agree. Um, you know, talking to a employment lawyer uh, is very smart thing to do at this time. And uh, the lawyer you mentioned, Agatha, he's based in Ontario. If anybody yeah. is based outside of Ontario and would like a referral, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, to make one. <clears throat> And do you have any uh, suggestions, uh, Agatha, for um, your hygiene recall? Because I know you've been a big proponent of having a strong hygiene department. And how are you kind of looking at this uh, from a recall standpoint? And what are the things that dentists should be considering prior to reopening as it pertains to their hygiene department? So obviously, we're going to be um, restructuring based on the new regulations, whether they're temporary or permanent. So that's something to be aware of. I um, I feel like that's probably going to be the one department that, if it's strong in your practice, will help you move through faster through that curve that we're talking about. And if your hygiene department is strong and your patients are coming back um, on recommended intervals, um, on recommended treatment, then it's one of those things that I think and that's one thing I was mentioning earlier, I'm getting a lot of patients really concerned about missing out on their cleanings per se, or periodontal therapy. So I think if you already had a strong hygiene department, I think it'll be an easier transition because all it is is just getting, calling people back or contacting them saying, hey, we're back on, let's talk about, you know, how to get you back in with the following changes that have been implemented by our governing body. Um, the practices that didn't have strong hygiene systems, now is the time to really focus on that. So you've got downtime, sit down and learn to figure out, you know, how to strengthen your hygiene department, what's missing in it, why are people not coming back on time, why are they not coming back for what's recommended, why are they only relying on like insurance scale units versus what they truly need. So really focusing, breaking it down to the basics, which is, one of the things that I did, anybody who knows my story, that's exactly what I did in 2008 because um, I was going to get out of dentistry. And that's the one thing that changed my mind to stay in and just really building like an ultimate hygiene department that really strengthens your practice is key to, I think, long term success moving forward. Yeah, you know, I want to pre I appreciate that the fact that everybody stuck with us for over an hour now. And there's been a ton of valuable information. And it's very funny, I've been seeing these questions roll up and then we start answering them. So I'm glad you bared with us until a lot of those questions got uh, answered during the conversation. Uh, you know, Sina, right now you're in a position that you could speak to dentists that might be struggling or, or maybe in a position where they were considering transition in the past. And what is that gonna look like going into the future? And how can a DSO help and support that environment? So for those doctors that are considering transitioning, I think a lot of the transition plans that you've had in place um, now highly depend on uh, whether you had high exposure to the financial markets, right? So what we saw in 2008 is some dentists were delaying their retirement because of the impact that the stock market had on their savings. Uh, other dentists decided, I'm already 62 years old and I have had a good run and I've been very conservative with my investment portfolio. And so I don't want to take a chance that we're not going to recover from this recession. And if there's a buyer out there that's going to give me a fair offer, I'm going to take it. Um, so I think each province and each state is going to differ slightly because there's going to be some states, let's say like New York or in Canada, some provinces like uh, Alberta that are going to be more severely impacted by the downturn. And they've not only been hit, like I said, with the coronavirus, but have also been exposed to the oil market crash, which is now recovering, right? Um, but so I think if you're looking at transition, the one value that a lot of DSOs bring to the table is that they allow you to continue practicing dentistry uh, like you did before um, for as many years in many cases as you want because they don't have any interest in actually doing chair-side uh, clinical work, right? And so if you're a dentist who's even mid-career or younger, 
and you have had it with all this HR and all this lease negotiation uh, work, and you say to yourself, I feel like I'm getting burnt out here. I just want to go back to working with my hands, uh, go back to what I was taught to do in now school. With a lot of DSOs, what they can give you is the ability to work there long term, whereas what I've seen in my days prior to MCA advising associates, many associates that come in and buy a clinic, if they don't like the selling dentist to stay on for six months, they're going to boot them out, right? And so uh, if you can ideally structure an agreement with the buyer to guarantee yourself the ability to generate income for five years, I think that's fantastic if you don't want to deal with the practice management side of things. For those that are looking to maintain 100% clinical and business autonomy, this is where coaches like your sophomore come in. This is where Agatha can offer a lot of uh, advice as a completely independent practice owner, not being supported by a DSO, and how she's going to be thriving in this economy, right? And so there's multiple options available. And I would highly recommend to doctors that are thinking about selling your clinic, you got to really talk to buyers, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, intermediaries in this marketplace, and I feel sometimes information doesn't get relayed to the seller uh, the way it should through these intermediaries. And part of it has to do with the fact that when we are looking to have a conversation with the dentist, you know, not all DSOs are created equally, and the models differ quite significantly across Canada and the U.S. There are some DSOs that start practices from scratch or can partner with you in building multiple practices from scratch. There's others that want to buy 100% of your clinic and doesn't, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to have you uh, necessarily, um, you know, retire immediately, right? And so figuring out how you're going to work with a particular organization, I think is critical. It doesn't really matter who that is, right? It could be a single uh, location uh, office that's looking to add a second location, or it could be you want to outsource all of your non-clinical functions to a DSO, but understand that each of these DSOs offer something different and engaging with them um, today gives you the opportunity to understand what your options are. You don't have any obligation to work with any of them, but it's good to understand what's out there. Um, yeah, I think we're uh, tying it all up. I think Mark's uh, mic got muted, so I guess I'll just finish. Um, I just want to say one thing. You know, my mom always said everything happens for a reason, and as difficult as it seems, um, you know, at the time when we're going through like a challenge like this one, um, my mom's always been right. So I believe that this too shall pass. And if we can get something out of this, like learn something or change something or improve something, then we will become more resilient as a result. And I wanna support everybody. I wanna support you in learning what that one thing might be for you. And just say that if we as dentists can come together as professionals and focus on how to get stronger as a profession rather than individually, then we will all come out of this stronger and more respected than ever. And in the end, that has sort of always been my own personal passion and motivation, which is what I've mentioned to you before. And it's to change the way people see us um, as dentists. And my goal is to help all of us elevate especially now that we've got this really unique opportunity to have time to learn and time to connect. So if anybody wants to reach out to like any of us and um